I have someone on my team who used to work with another brokerage um, and she informed our team that there are brokerages out there that train their agents to be adversarial. And that's sometimes what you're dealing with as well. So when you use tactical empathy, it kind of, it, they don't expect it, um, but it works with them. I would say almost more because of the fact that they're trained in this other way of negotiating. And when they're trained in that other way, they're not going to display it. But to her point, they're highly susceptible to it. They will react to it. So um, going back to what we were talking about before, Anna Maria, first of all, start talking to the listing agent as if you're an advocate for them, as if you really care about them, about their worldview, about everything that they're going through because they're trying to sell this $300,000 property at half a million because they can in this market. How, so talk, make sure that you demonstrate for them that you understand what it is that they're going through. And that's what starts to separate you. That's what starts to, to move you out of the pack of the other 20 offers that are there. Because I can tell you the other 19 people that they're dealing with are not talking that way. Yeah, I can see that. I guess um, when, when I was saying what's important to the seller, um, it's not just that one question, you know, I try mm -hmm. to, to go into what you said. Most of them are just so quick and they don't have time, you know, for anyone. So Marcella, would you be opposed to just kind of sharing or role modeling how uh, a conversation would go? You know, if I'm somebody's the listing agent and they just got 20 offers and most of the times they don't even pick up the phone, you know, they'll just text if they even do that. They'll just text you. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely try to get them on the phone. That's the best way to negotiate. Um, in fact, I like to set the expectation of the negotiation continuing over the phone, even if we go under contract with them. Um, so that, that's so helpful, but an accusations audit would be, um, I'm going to sound like every other, the 30 last agents that just called you expecting that my offer is going to be the best. I, ex this is going to sound like I'm peppering you for information that you don't want to give. Um, this is going to, I'm going to sound like all I care about is my client and understanding what will win this deal. Um, I'm going to seem so inconsiderate with your time. Cause I think time's a big deal for, for agents, all of us buyers or seller side. Mm -hmm. um, we all are dealing with when in a market like this, it feels like we're triaging cases or triaging mm -hmm. clients. And so I'm very aware of that in my accusations audit. And usually at that point, they just cut me off because they're annoyed, mm -hmm. right? Or be, because they're, they just want to, hear the information, but they're giving me permission at that point to communicate information to them that they may not have even been open to hearing. Okay. And then that's when, you know, we, we discuss where I am with the offer or I ask them questions, whatever it might be. Do you usually ask them directly, you know, what is the highest offer or something in those lines? I'm usually a little less, um, I usually don't approach it with exactly what is your highest offer. Mm -hmm. I say it a different way. Um, it sounds like you have a lot of offers that your, your client's extremely happy with. Um, what do those offers not have that, that you would be, you would like to see, or your client would like to see in an offer, which is a kind of a different way of saying the same thing. And then I find that they mm -hmm. open me that way because they're not being directly asked what is your highest offer um and then they give me a lot then it's quite you have to be silent okay. just let them talk cool 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind jumping in here if you on this with uh, a recent situation that worked with the uh, QT plus one I kind of stumbled into. Would that be, yes, a, would it be a problem to do that? So um, I showed up for a uh, showing uh, with my buyers and the listing agent was there. She was happening to have an open house going. And it, I could have been irritated about that. But I thought, ah, this is a great opportunity to talk to her. So while I was waiting for my clients, um, I, I was talking to her. I had happened to see her. She had happened to present an offer on one of my other properties and lost it. So I spent a lot of time empathizing with her about that and how good an offer it was. And I really you know, was disappointed that we weren't able to work together. And then I worked in, I said, it seems like you have a lot of... Um, buyer activity on this home. Oh, excuse me. That's, pardon me. And uh, she responded, oh, yes, yes. Um, we've received an offer on it. And I said, you've received an offer? Um, and she said, yeah, you know, but the clients, they want to make a decision tonight. And then I said, would it be unreasonable for me to bring you a full price offer? And she said, no, it would need to be over asking. And I said, over asking? And she said, yeah, just a little over asking. If... <laughs> and then I said, okay. And I said, would it, uh, would it be a problem if we waived the inspection contingencies and just went straight to a contract? Because uh, it's a new construction, newer construction. Um, would that be a problem? She said, no, that'd be very favorable. So I was able to get these terms and we ended up getting the, getting the, the home for the client. That's awesome. How much is just a little bit over? What does that mean? Uh, we were, let's see, we went about 15,000 over. Okay. Uh, but in this market, we've been, I mean, yeah, it's been much more than that, much more than that. I know. But what we did is we, we put up 20,000 in non-refundable due diligence and waived the inspection period. So, um, we were, you know, to do that, you know, we're, we're in. But we were we were confident, and that's what's kind of taken. That's winning. That's kind of, in our market the winning formula right now is waiving due diligence and giving them you know, as much money as you can up front. Right, right, and and that that goes to support that notion that price is only one term. Right. You know, there are many other there there are other terms that can be that are concessionable that can make a deal more palatable, um, but. Price is probably the most emotional word in the negotiation lexicon because yeah. it, it it drives people crazy on the positive and the negative side. It it, it it's so seductive and yet so um, so tied to identity that it becomes deal breakers more often than not. Yeah. But I think the uh, the big takeaway for me was don't be irritated if the listing agent's there at an open house. <laughs> you know, that's a great opportunity to to get some information to empathize with them and and pull that out. And she told me more than she should have, quite frankly, because my my folks would have gone higher. Um, but um, she let me know that we could go in lower. All right, so let's let's I'm going to pull that apart just a little bit. Okay. First, my first question, because I'm unwashed, um, the problem with the listing agent being at the open house is what? Um, just, you know, you, when you normally when you show up for um, a showing in our market, you want to um, be able to try on the house and have them walk around and have a conversation without uh, that information with the uh, being shared, being uh overheard by the listing agent. Gotcha. So, you know, I had an appointment at a designated time and there were other people there. Okay. Uh, gotcha. But I saw that as an opportunity now to be able to get information face to face from the, from the listing agent, which I normally wouldn't have. Perfect. Got irritated that they were there. People were there. You had that time uh, blocked out for you and your client. And so it's understandable. There was a certain level of irritation. Many people would let that irritation carry the day and affect their behavior, their attitude in a, in a negative in a negative fashion. You chose it to take it not as an ordeal, but as an adventure. 
and engage the listing agent. And because, and, and it wasn't only because um, of this, but um, because you decided to engage them from their perspective, what did she do for you? She provided you with information that you that she probably shouldn't have. Right. Because you made, um, it's a woman, I guess, you made her feel yep. so good by just taking the time to listen to her perspective that she felt obligated. This is, this is the power in tactical empathy. It's the power in our stuff. Tactical empathy is the foundation upon which the Black Swan Method is built. And this is, the, this is a, 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 um, a great example of the power of tactical empathy. It encourages reciprocity. Subconsciously, she now feels obligated to share with you because of the fact that you took care of her defenses. Yeah, and, and also, and also the fact that I, I, we spent probably five to ten minutes talking about the deal she lost on one of my listings and how bad I felt for her for that. Mm. So that really opened up the empathy door. Yeah. So I tell you guys always be conscious, be cautious of of common ground, but, but understand that if there is common ground, as there was in this case, um, the black swan method makes common ground that much stronger. Common ground by itself is a pretty weak tactic. I'm not telling you that you can't make deals using common ground. You just don't make as many as you should if that's all you're relying on. And so the fact that you guys had it, were in a transaction together that, that fell through and, and the pain that you felt for her because of it, huge, huge. What's the, what's the uh, black swan um, way of doing common ground or what's the distinction in the black swan method? All right, so um, there is no black swan equivalent to common ground. Common ground is black or white. It either is or it isn't. You either have it or you don't. Our problem with common ground is for some people, myself included, I, on some level internally, take offense to common ground because there's a little there's a little piece of my brain that is telling me that you are using common ground with me as a tool expecting me to acquiesce yeah i i'm, so, I'm like you i have a little bit of that in me yeah i if if i say yeah i had a great weekend this weekend and went to a soccer tournament and watched my daughter play soccer for two straight days they won the championship and then the next words out of your mouth your daughter plays soccer I know how to play soccer. Let's make a deal. You've already made an yeah. assumption that I'm that I'm gonna do what you need me to do. Uh, the example that I like to use all the time is when I was back in the, in the police days and I was on the road and I see a violation. I light the violator up, pull him to the side of the road, and before I even unbuckle my seatbelt, there's a badge hanging out of the window of the violating vehicle. It used to drive me absolutely <laughs> nuts because they've already made an assumption that I'm gonna let them walk simply because they also carry a badge. And they've made certain um, prejudicial judgments about me that I don't like. So, just, so that's one of the warnings for, for common ground. Um, and, and the other warning for common ground is, um, again, if you rely heavily on it and it's not there, what are you left with? If that's your go-to move and there is no common ground, what are you left with? You're left with either nothing or trying to lie about common ground on some level. And so I'm not telling you not to use it, just be judicious and make sure that you're genuine and it's a part of the overall approach to tactical empathy. It's not everything that you're relying on. Marcelo, did you want to add anything to common ground? 
Um, no, as an assertive, I get frustrated with common ground when I'm really busy because you can like newer agents will call and start with common ground. And then if I'm not sure if anybody else has dealt with this, but you'll have a great conversation during the tran the beginning in the beginning of the transaction. And then that agent may not be as seasoned and the, the interaction turns into there's they don't have common ground anymore and they don't have the experience. And so there's not a lot of um, ability to, to deal with the difficult processes that are coming forward in the transaction. So just be careful with common ground because I think seasoned agents wanna work with other agents who know how to negotiate and deal with difficult conversations. Yeah. And we, go ahead. Thanks, Derek. Uh, what do we do when people are trying to do it to us? You know, once I went to buy a, uh, a little portable stereo at the um, Best Buy, you know, that's one of those electronic shops. And the guy said, hey, you're from England. You got an English accent. I go, yeah. And I was in a hurry. I had to buy it and get back to work. Oh, I went to England. And probably all he did was go through Heathrow Airport, you know, while he's, the way he talked. Because I didn't see anything there. <laughs> yeah. So how do you stop someone and say, hey, buddy, it doesn't work on me? Well, I don't want to say that. But I don't no, want to get into that. I don't want him to waste my time. Well, here, in, in the environment that you're just talking about there, he's not trying. There's no next step after that. This is a one-off transaction. So this one is, off, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's no next step with that. And so in, in a best buy type of situation, I don't get out of shape because I know he's not, you know, I know he's not going to try to sell me that, you know, that fifty dollar portable stereo for seventy five, and then we're going to get back, get into a haggle back and forth. I know he's not trying to get over on me. He's pro he may be just you know small talk. I even or once an internet company wanted me to advertise on uh -huh. Facebook. He's doing the same thing, which would have been more of a long term, and we didn't talk about pricing yet. And he went on the line and Zoom and and started this small talk, and I'm thinking, I'm busy. So, you know, in my mind. So. It, your your subconscious is going to tell you, is it genuine, or is he trying to make? Is he making assumptions about what our relationship is going to look like in the near and distant future? And so, you want to probe that just a little bit, because yeah. again, not everybody is doing it maliciously. Not everybody is doing it to try to get over on you, but. If your if your spider spider senses start tingling, then you need to probe it a little bit more to try to find out something more about where they're going with this, where what their integrity is. Do well, do your core values um, yeah. line up? If it's nothing more um, than hitting them with, it sounds like since the both your son and my son play soccer, our relationship should go along just as swimmingly. Well, what, what, what occurred to me in this one is that he's not a natural salesperson, and, uh, but he's following some kind of methodology like, you know, Mr. ABC sales book. I could just right. tell. So, right. it, so in, in a sense, he was getting himself in that. But once they start saying, oh, you got children, how old? I'm thinking, what? You know, but you could tell with a methodology, that's my thing. You know, methodology of five-step sales process that he yeah. his boss taught him. Yeah, he, he's he's checking boxes yeah. on a script. Uh, but it, if we're being honest, who does that sound like? Checking boxes on a script that we're going down. Who does that sound like? It sounds like sounds like all of us. Which goes back to my earlier point: What are we doing to separate ourselves from the pack? Mm. What is Marcella doing to separate her 1.5 million in the, in the, and I know that's not large. I know there are other areas of country that have a, a larger concentration of agents, but ask yourself, what is, what do you think Marcella is doing to separate herself from 1.5 million other people in the DMV? What are you doing to separate yourself? 